All right. Thank you, Owen and Herc. That was an awesome, awesome session. Super, super interesting. Um, I am back for anyone who wasn't with us for our first session. My name is Doug Greenberg. I'm a writer here at FOS. Um, and this time I am back with Roger Bennett. Uh, Raj, as we've come to know him, is the founder of the Men in Blazers Net Media Network, which has become one of the most listened to football platforms in the world. Uh, he hosts a slew of podcasts covering multiple leagues in the men's and women's game. He created the number one podcast series, American Fiasco, with WNYC Studios and HBO's Succession and Band of Brothers podcasts, as well as the newly released World Corrupt, a six-episode podcast collaboration with Tommy Vietor and Crooked Media. Uh, his TV show, Men in Blazers, appears on NBC's Peacock. He is also the author of Reborn in the USA, an Englishman's love letter to his chosen home, uh, which debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and Men in Blazers' new book, uh, Gods of Soccer, which was released on October 11th, 2022. My birthday, not that anyone's asking. Um, <laughs> during the World Cup, Roger and Men in Blazers will be conducting live shows across the country on a widely anticipated national tour. Okay, that is an awesome lengthy amazing intro for our next guest thank you so much for joining us roger bennett doug greenberg that was a lot yeah well it was, uh, you know you you've got a really impressive resume how you doing today oh i'm so delighted to be with you i've got to tell you i love front office sports i love what you're doing i love the audience that you're building and it's genuinely with the world cup within touching distance it's a joy to be with you today yeah well we are we're so happy to have you here uh you are you have actually become one of the preeminent voices on American soccer, which for, you know, maybe some backstory uh, for people who don't know, uh, you are from England. Uh, so how did that happen? How did you go from being from England and becoming this full on American supporter? You're a beautiful human being. I grew up in Liverpool in the 1980s, town in which music and football were everything. Uh, but I grew up at a time um, when the North just post industrial collapse happened, unemployment soared, heroin epidemic, general hopelessness. I actually wrote the book about it, Reborn in the USA, about how it was you know, heart to heart, Fantasy Island, Miami Vice, Run DMC, Tracy Chapman, uh, the Chicago Bears Super Bowl winning team, 1985. They, they just seemed larger than life, filled with technicolor possibility. And I kind of fed on the American golden crumbs, showed me that different possibilities uh, could be lived. And I moved to Chicago at the earliest opportunity after university and just never left. Um, and it coincided with the 1994 World Cup, which was meant to put football in America over the top, like a yo-yo or a pogo stick. Um, we can talk about the sports climb in a moment, but it was where I first saw the US men take the field, ginger of hair, stonewashed denim of jersey. And it was a staggering moment. I was just like, oh my God, these guys are underdogs. Like Liverpool always felt like an underdog as a city when I grew up and I fell in love from that moment. That's really the long answer, Doug. And the short answer is when Piers Morgan is on one side of an argument, I always just, my number one rule in life is just immediately to take the other. So when the US play England on November the 25th, oh, it'll be go, go USA for me. Fantastic. I mean, you know, you know, I'll be rooting for the US as well. Um, before we kind of get into all that as well, I do want to give you a second to uh, plug because Men in Blazers has been amazing uh we've already got people in our comments being like oh my god i love men and blazers so much it, you guys have become just such an amazing network um you know I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of time we actually wrote up an article uh my my colleague michael mccarthy who i believe is in the audience uh wrote up a nice article about what you guys have done in terms of your growth uh in the last couple of years you know so what does that look like from your perspective it's, first of all, it's been an honor to move to the nation I love and see the sport I love, football, move from really the periphery to the center. You know, we have an audience that's 20 to 30. Um, I look like this because we did a live show last night in New York City with John Oliver uh, representing the entire nation of England, Matthew Reese from the Americans representing Wales, and Kelly O'Hara, thank God, double World Cup winner. Uh, joining me to represent the United States of America. Uh, we had over a 1,000 fans there coming to connect, to commune, to revel in um, football. 
And while I've been here, you know, many places has grown exponentially. We started off as one podcast. We're now a full flourishing network, 12 podcasts. During the World Cup, we're doing a live tour across the United States. St. Louis, we're coming for you next. Um, and we did a deal with Twitch where we're uh, twitching live um, a slew of games in person, leasing uh, I think 47 hours of of podcast content throughout the World Cup. We want to win it for America, uh, no matter what happens on the field. And it's been the joy of a lifetime. I remember moving here and when my team, Everton, were in a massive game in 1995. It wasn't on television at all. I had to call my dad and he held the phone against the radio so that I could follow along in Liverpool. And now football is everywhere. The audience is in the demo. Every stream up has you know football at the tip of the arrow to try and attract uh, an audience. And we and Men in Blazers, I always say, I feel like Kelly Slater just riding a massive wave of Americans falling in love with football on the men's side and the women's side, both very important uh, stories. So I am, I am like Kelly Slater, but bald. <laughs> you guys are very similar in a lot of other ways too, I would think. Hey, ride the wave. That's what we're talking about. Um, yeah, well, let's get into, let's get into talking about some United States soccer, right? Please. Or football. Um, let's, let's start with the, the U S men's national team, right? They are kicking off on Monday against Wales. That is a massive, massive matchup to start off, uh, arguably their biggest game of the group. Um, what do you think we can expect from them this year in this world cup? And then maybe we can start thinking ahead and what what can we expect from them when the World Cup comes here in 2026? So I don't like to be hyperbolic and dramatic, but I think we can expect world domination and biblical smiting and American glory. Um, we might not get it, but this is the joy of the run-up to the World Cup. I do want to acknowledge a surreally just soulless, dark, corrupt, cravenly, brazenly awful World Cup FIFA. I know you've had other sessions on that, but just to normalize the World Cup, and six and a half thousand deaths of workers who built it for us and just treat the football just as football is. We, this is a World Cup of split screens where we must not allow the football to kick off and just become anesthetized to Lionel Messi. We've got to hold both truths um, at the same time. And having said that, uh, you know, I did a whole series, World Corrupt, with Tommy Vito looking into why FIFA, why Qatar, and what we as fans can do about it. Um, which I can happily talk about. Um, but you're asking about the United States. This is a remarkable time to be alive in the US. We, we failed to qualify for the 2018 World Cup. And in reaction, all our young players realized that to be the best they could be, they couldn't stay here. They had to move en masse to Europe. And we used to be excited as Americans when one of our players was playing against a great team, Chelsea, Juventus, Milan. And now... We have talents who are playing for all of them. Christian Pulisic from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Tyler Adams. Oh, just what a joyous human being from Wappingers Falls, New York. Brendan Aronson. Uh, Medford Messi uh, from New Jersey. And so it's a delirious, incredibly young, incredibly raw set of individuals. And when a team is young... Um, they don't know to be afraid. They don't know what they should. They're just like, let's do this. We're going to win it. And spoiler alert, they are probably not going to win the World Cup, but they're going to learn an incredible amount together. Uh, as a collective, they are not where they should be. Um, and part of the reason is we who love football in this country um, for a long time, we, when I moved here, you know, football was not just not liked. It was actively hated. I mean, it really was almost we protest of too much with our hate. And so a lot of the football culture here is still trying to prove itself to itself. We're still quite insecure, both internally. You know, we want people to love us. We want more Americans to love us. And in the world, we're too desperate to show the world that we can play too. Um, and I think this team is guilty occasionally, tactically, through their manager of trying to play too complicated a style of football. And if this young team, I have a show with, uh, with the captain, Tyler Adams. He and I have done a show every month where he's talked about the journey to the World Cup. And in the last one, Tyler said, if we can start to play more pragmatic football, more robust, simpler, less complicated football, we can be that great collective that has always been the American way. And that's what I'd love to see in this tournament. Yeah, you know, and it's it's something that they can they can work towards that, right? And 
as you, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know that they're that they're winning this one. I would love that. I, I'm not really counting on it, but I, you got to think that maybe they can build some momentum from this World Cup for the one when it's when it really quote unquote matters in 2026 when it's coming back here. Um, you know, do you, do you think that's a reasonable thing to say that they could make a legitimate run in 2026? Oh, Ducky G, you know, I, I, I want to be clear, like these will, the joy of the World Cup is, and this is what John Oliver said on stage last night, it's the spine of our life. They're so rare. You know, all of us just have a handful of World Cups in our life. And so I don't believe that, oh, we're not ready for this, but the next one. You, you go into every World Cup and you have to savor every second. We can't write it. It's not like a, you know, a, a Chicago Bears season where we're tanking this year, but like three years time, we're going to really have all the pieces in place. You do it now because there's no other choice. We have to wait four more years for this thing. But there is a great outcome with this team. World Cups have their own ecosystem. Teams can find their rhythm there. They're essentially all-star teams flung together onto the field. Um, and even more so in this ridiculous Qatar reality, November World Cup, where they've hardly had time to practice together. So there is a scenario where we're shocked, surprised, and they go deep in the tournament. We dance like we're at our own kid's wedding. But there's also a the scenario that I won't even say the dark scenario because I don't want to speak it into existence. And the reality is the silver lining, these kids will learn from this experience. They will become battle-hardened, uh, more wizened poet warriors, um, and come uh, 2026, when the World Cup is here and in Canada and in Mexico, but really in the United States, uh, en masse, just the noise, the joy, the commercial um, pouring in of brands and marketing dollars, um, the noise there. This World Cup 2026 will do what 1994 was meant to do, which was to put football over the top in this nation. And the legacy of 2026 will be that the United States will finally be a normal football nation. I would love this. I love the sound of that. And to be fair, there has been a team that has actually made a lot of progress in progressing soccer in the United States. But, but spoiler alert, twist, it wasn't the U.S. men's national team. It was the women's team. The, the women's team, this, this was something I wanted to make sure I talked about with you. We talked Please. about it in our, in our pre-show. The women's team has had such an immense impact culturally, you know, competition wise. They have just been so successful. Um, you know, I just wanted to get some of your thoughts on how big an impact they have had uh, just on, on the sport in this country. Well, they've had two impacts, Doug, and both are seismic and both are joyous. And uh, in this country, um, in 1994, as I said, the soccer World Cup was meant to put the sport over the top. We joke on our show that uh, soccer, America's sport of the future, as it has been since 1972, just perpetually, it's always going to be the next big thing. Uh, the reality is the rise of football has been slow and steady. It was meant to be overnight. But football doesn't work like that. And instead, the internet has connected an audience here to the great teams, you know, Liverpool, Manchester United, Chelsea, as closely from Los Angeles uh, or Alabama uh, or Minneapolis as if they lived in the same zip code as the, the fans of the teams uh, who are local. The, the amount of football that's live in the United States, even more than there is in England where they black out so many games, this is the place to follow every single league. You have Paramount+, Plus, you have ESPN+, Plus, you have Peacock all battling uh, with their streaming offerings and football is at the arrowhead um, of all of those. And there is this young audience that's risen. EA Sports FIFA is a game which has sensitized a generation uh, to the players, the teams, the Star Wars cantina of elite football in dorm room after dorm room across the nation. But it's the women's team and their glory every four years, back-to-back -back, uh, winners. And now the NWSL, the league rising commercially, um, the story of my lifetime in sports is the rise of women's football. I grew up in Liverpool where when a girl kicked a football in the 80s in, the, in my deeply misogynistic, macho, awful culture, they were derided, mocked, they were flung to the periphery. And now our women's team is the darling of the nation. They just played America at Wembley Stadium. 90,000 people were there. And it's growth, not just here, but across the world, that is the dizzying story. So the U.S. women have done an incredible um, job 
in raising the proof, raising the profile. They're the winners. America loves winners, and they are bloody winners. So they've risen the profile of the sport here in the United States. But the second effect is that they've been pathfinders for England, for Spain, for Germany, for France, now Africa, Nigeria. Um, and so many uh, nations look to what these U.S. women have done, fighting for equality, and they've been pathfinders in that regard too. And they are, to me, they, they're a team that transcends sports in the greatest way. Uh, and I admire them all so deeply. We have a podcast, a weekly podcast on our platform called The Women's Game, where eight of the best women's players in the United States talk on a weekly basis. And to, to, to support that narrative has been one of the most meaningful things that I've been involved in. They, they've just done so much, right? And it's, you know, I, I think you could even attribute like you said, they, America loves a winner and they just kept winning. And I think that that really raised the profile of the game in the United States. Um, you know, you talk about TV rights, you talk about uh, let's like, for example, Apple TV plus uh, just took over these, this humongous MLS deal, right? That mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I, who knows if that would happen. As you said, like the, the women's team has played a humongous role in that, um, the MLS, of course, has played its own role in that. The NWSL has played its role in that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, of course, and that leads us right back to the kind of the point of this, the road to 2026, right? Um, it, it's not so much that – I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. I don't know if it's that, the, that 2026 World Cup. It, I don't know that that's so much going to be a launching point as it's almost like a celebration, right, of like where the sport has come in this country. I, I, I want to see kind of what you think about that. 2026 is it's just really, I think about it, it's just paradise. Um, there's so many human beings in this nation who've yearned um, for football to be normalized. 1994, football really was in America like space to Captain Kirk, the final frontier. This was the last vacuum that football had not permeated around the world. The World Cup that we're about to celebrate um I, I've, it's been compared to a global eclipse that strikes the entire planet for a whole month instantaneously and that was everywhere apart from the united states i can remember 1990 being a, a counselor in maine on a camp i was the creepy english counselor and england were in the world cup semi-final and i had, took the day off drove around maine tried to find a bar that would play me the bloody world cup final like, hey boy they were like the Portland Sea Dogs, or wherever the, the local team was, then they were they were playing the game. No one would change the channel for the World Cup semi final. I, I was like bereft. Look, England lost on penalties to the Germans, so maybe I dodged a bullet. But um, we have come so far, so fast, Doug. And '94, it was meant to. It was designed to turn us into football lovers um and as i said instead it's been slow and steady world cup to world cup like a wave hitting the beach leaving a bigger and bigger audience and then the rise of uh of broadcast all the factors that are detailed earlier and where we are now remember like when i moved to dc in uh the early 2000s i used to go and watch premier league football in a bar the lucky bar in dc and it would be me and 10 english blokes um, we'd be there every week, uh, like communing with this sport, never an American in there. And then 2006, during the World Cup, I happened to be back in D.C. with my wife and USA were playing Italy. And I went to the same bar to watch the game. And the line was just thronging round and round the block. It was like the Beatles had reformed. And it was that moment that I realized that there was an audience here, that football did have you know, this deep, deep um, and deeply learned and deeply passionate audience is when I realized I, I wanted to set up and dedicate my life to building uh, what has become uh, Men in Blazers. But this World Cup coming here, um, what it does, um, it brings in so much commercial might. The number of brands pouring into the sport right now, massive brands um, on the men's side. And now finally, thank God, belatedly on the women's side, um, what that does is give the sport the muscle um, to market itself and permeate the culture. I mean, to be honest, you see the World Cup right now. They've moved it to November. It's going up against the NFL. If we're being honest, the World Cup is not where it should be. Normally, it's in the summer and everyone's talking about it because it's competing against nothing else. The World Cup is not in the culture, in the place that it should be and that it needs to be. 2026, 
the World Cup will be omnipresent. Um, and then the legacy of that ultimately is what I think we, uh, we will, we've, we've all dreamt of. Yeah, and, and you know, it, what's an interesting point you kind of bring up is just that it's been this slow and steady rise and 94 was not the, the launch pad that it was supposed to be, right? Correct. So I'm just kind of looking at historically, why is it in your mind that until, you know, very recently, soccer's sort of taken a back seat to the other pro sports in the United States? Because they were here first. They had first mover advantage. Um, and... Ultimately, you can trace it back if you want me to be a little bit more scholarly and uh, plodding um, and English. Ultimately, um, football, soccer here um, before the Great Depression was an ethnic sport. Um, It was Greek Americans playing against Italian Americans, Hungarian Americans, and there was flourishing leagues, but they were all pro and semi-pro. And then the Great Depression happened. Uh, They got obliterated financially. And um, because they had no collegiate roots, they didn't sustain. And so you could trace it back to that moment. And then the history of football has been one catching up with the American sports which did establish themselves. Baseball in the era of uh, golden radio. Uh, The NFL in the period of television, the perfect televisual sport. And soccer's comeback has been because it's the perfect internet sport. As I said, Earlier, when I moved here, my team, Everton, uh, the world's greatest football team, when I was here, it was very hard to connect to what was going on there. You know, so I fell in love with the Chicago White Sox, the Washington Bullets um, of that t- of that period, and you know, connecting myself to American sports. But the internet allowed me once again, once that promulgated, to connect to the injuries, the rumors, the analysis, and um, and then streaming. Uh, really pushed it back and it football soccer global soccer has become the perfect sport for the technologies of the age and that's what's ultimately um almost a century after the 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 early thriving leagues were wiped out by the great depression has allowed it to return i mean ultimately it's technologically driven uh it's the perfect sport for the technologies of our age and um, with this marketing muscle, which I'm, you know, our platform is feeling, the number of brands coming in, lifting up men in blazers, allowing us to cover more of these leagues. We start off as one podcast. Uh, we're now a dozen. We're putting properties against every single league, the women's game, the Champions League, um, you know, U.S. men's um, uh, uh, footballers, the Premier League, always the Premier League. If that was a band, the Premier League would be the lead singer. Um, and so th- th- we can only do that because of the commercial uh, support that's coming in that allows us to hire producers, editors, writers, um, and we're all feeling it. Everybody in football is just feeling this incredible upsurge, and it's 2026, which is driving it on. Exactly, and, and that's a great segue to come back to 2026 because, as you, men- you mentioned before, that this is what this resurgence in American interest in the sport has has led to, um, and so we know what that immediate future kind of looks like. So then, what does the what does the post twenty twenty six World Cup look like for U.S. soccer, U.S. football? Um, yeah, I often wonder. I've asked everybody that I've interviewed, "Am I going to see a U.S. team win the World Cup in my lifetime?" Um, you know, and I'm thinking I'm going to have to do the Ted Williams cryogenic chamber thing. Just stick my head in there. Uh, just to get a couple of extra years. We, it took John Oliver last night on the stage said, yes, undoubtedly. Tim Howard said, no. Um, I'm getting answers from different places. Kaka, the Brazilian great, yes, and uh, undoubtedly. And the tectonic plates and the football are constantly shifting. So on the women's side, the league, NWSL, are flourishing to be um, to really be a full-throated footballing powerhouse in the same way as Every league with a marketing muscle, there's the delirious fan base, which is already there. The broadcast, the ratings are ticking up. And just these stadia right now, 30,000, 40,000, the, the, um, the spectacular is becoming normalized. And I do, I, I'd like to see and or imagine a world post-2026 when they're routinely getting 40, 50,000 fans. And that's a real platform for the sport to grow um, in that virtuous cycle of commercial support, allowing the sport to get bigger, amplifying it. 
um, and all that. On the men's side, what's fascinating, as I said earlier, we've got these young players moving to Europe en masse. The talent of the US soccer players just become elite. We used to be seen and we are seen right now. I taped a podcast which is coming out on Sunday with Rory Smith, my mate from the New York Times. We do a, a regular podcast about European football called European Nights. And I asked Rory to talk about the US players and how they're seen in Europe. And he said they're seen as good citizens, good hard workers, decent men, don't cause trouble. Um, he essentially made them sound like good old kind of students abroad um, who were just there to see Europe. But he said what's really happened is they've become bloody skillful and they're incredible footballers. The world just doesn't see them as that yet. Um, and he said if they have a good run in this World Cup, it will change the stereotype, the perception. If we have a bad World Cup, the stereotype will be reinforced. Um, so by 2026, a great World Cup will allow us to shatter that stereotype from a playing perspective. There's the coaching dimension, um, which is we have one coach who is elite at the moment, Jesse Marsh from Racine, Wisconsin, uh, manager of Leeds United, an incredibly tenacious human being. I love Jesse. And when I speak to him, I say, God, Jesse, you are effed right now when you do well. All the fans are just like, hey, Ted Lasso, hey, Ted Lasso. And the moment you lose, they're like, fire him. He's a Yankee bastard. Um, so, you know, he can he doesn't get respect either way. And it's incredibly hard. I'd like to see more coaches going over out of the bubble, the safety of America and becoming truly. You only become a great coach by cross pollinating ideas in Europe. It's impossible to do it remotely from here. So the players the coaches. And then finally, um, I mean, it's the weirdest and wackiest part of my last decade is watching one Premier League and elite sporting property be brought up by American owners after another. The future of elite football is American um, financial institution investor owners searching for more revenue lines, as Todd Burley says when he took over Chelsea. I'm going to double rev. Um, and that's fascinating. English football is about to become minority in the Premier League, majority owned by American owners. And that cross-pollination of ideas for good or for bad, because it is bloody complicated, these local, deeply held onto institutions being now owned by remote owners who kind of understand them. Uh, FSG, the Boston Red Sox, they truly understand what they're doing at Liverpool. And then there's owners like Manchester United owned by the Glazers who, you know, decade or so on are still they still still seem kind of uh, clueless to the English ways and they're constantly getting blow back and um, the strategy is helter-skelter. But the future of football, whether we dominate it on the field of our players, financially in an ownership capacity, is going to be is increasingly American, Doug. It, yeah, it's totally true. The You know, you want owners who are all in and who buy into the ways of doing things over there. Um, one thing I'll say about Jesse Marsh, I want to go back to him for a sure. second. I think that the comparisons to him as Ted Lasso are completely unfair because Ted Lasso got relegated. Um, so spoiler alert, uh, from season one, but, <laughs> um, I think we had some time. I'm going to take a couple questions from sure. the audience. Um, this is an interesting one. I'll kind of paraphrase this question. Um, this is from Robert Viegas, uh, down in the chat. Um, he is saying that, and this is something we haven't talked about that. 2026 is going to be an expansion to 48 teams in the tournament. Um, it's it's not something that a lot of people I think have thought about yet, um, but it's going to be an interesting. It's going to be interesting. Uh, I wanted to see kind of some of your thoughts on that one. Yeah, I mean, most of FIFA's ideas are unbelievably stupid, and um, you know, the World Cup is a beautiful thing that uh, is beautiful despite FIFA's best attempts to ruin it in every regard. I've got to be honest, I'm so focused on this Qatar issue, Saudi Arabia talking about coming in for the 2030 World Cup, uh, that it's hard for me to get my head around other mind-bending changes. Um, what will a 48-team um, reality do? Funny, the, the footballing rhythm that every four years this World Cup happens, it's so bloody rare. And so you have the narrative in between of the desire to qualify, the desperate urge to qualify. This year, Italy have missed out. Um, the year before, it, uh, Netherlands missed out, uh, USA missed out, Italy again uh, missed out. And what the 48 teams is going to do, it's going to remove a lot of that intrigue. Like the good teams are going to keep walk in there. 
Um, there'll be some more opportunity for delirious storylines. Look, the students I'm most excited about Wales in the World Cup for the first time since 1958 so that their nation can say, yeah, we're nothing to do with England. We hate them. We hate them. To stop confusing us. Uh, we had Matthew Rees from the Americans talk about that on our show last night. We just dropped it as a podcast. And it's amazing. 800 years of hate, he said, is going to come out when they take that field. Canada taking a field for the first time since 1986. Joyous, wonderful um, stories. I think that's what I'd say that could be positive to see more um, smaller stories make it um, into the big time. But it also become too much. You know, when you eat too much chocolate cake, um, you know, the Augustus glupification of of, of football, you do fall into the chocolate river and, and drown. And we're already seeing a World Cup where there's four games a day. They've jammed in four games a day. And I fear with the 40-plus uh, team World Cup, we're going to have the same. It's almost too much of a good thing, Doug. Mm -hmm. I understand that as well. You want to keep it special, right? And, um, you know, I'm going to give you one more question from the audience. Sure. Um you know, this is we're going back to the U.S. national team, uh, and this is this is from Paul Guglucci. I am really sorry if I mispronounced that. Paul in the chat, Paul uh, and he. This is his words, not mine. He says, "What does the U.S. national team need to do over the next four years to be a favorite at home for the 2026 World Cup?" His words, not mine, calling them a favorite, but I'll let I'll, I'll let you kind of address that one. <sighs> God, what a dream, Paulie G. What a dream. Uh, I, th I think who the next manager is going to be is going to be really the next big tactical question that we have to go our head around. And it's a fascinating conversation um, because leadership of a national team is incredibly important, uh, both on the field in terms of setting a strategy that's really effective. Um, and then um, more than ever, we need a uh, manager who's going to be a figurehead. Whoever is the next manager of the US team is essentially going to be the de facto face of the game in this incredible commercial moment. They'll be on every single uh, magazine. I believe US soccer will want that manager to be an American, to show that an American can lead the American team. Um, so I'd say it's a placeholder. Um, there's many human beings who I do believe could lead that team to glory. And by glory, really, what do we mean? Quarterfinals. It's a, a semi-finals where we've never done before. Baby steps. Let's not rush it. Let's take our time before it's too late. Uh, but who that manager is going to be is really going to be the, the next question, Paulie G, that will determine the answer. Love that. It's a great answer. Um, Raj, thank you so much. This was just an <laughs> unbelievable discussion. Um, you know, thank you for making the time. Uh, we you know, really appreciate you stopping by. Ducky G, honestly, front office sports, you guys rule. It's a joy to be with you. And everybody watching, take nothing for granted. Make great World Cup memories. And it's great to be with you. Big love, courage. All right. Thank you so much, Raj. And thank you to everybody in the comments who, uh, who contributed some questions. We apologize we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but that concludes our last session um, of this summit. And I'm going to hand it back to Lisa Granistein for our closing remarks. Thanks, Doug. That was such a great setup for next year's Women's Cup and the road to 2026, both of which FOS will be closely following. It does look like we're out of time. So on behalf of Front Office Sports, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to our incredible speakers, Grant Wall, Herc Gomez, and Raj Bennett. And a special thanks to our sponsor, Globin. Be sure to check out our podcasts, including The Newsroom, The Lead Off, and My Other Passion. Have a great rest of your day, and of course, enjoy the World Cup.